Uh, we are so thrilled to welcome Chef Anthony Bourdain and his team here to Google New York. You all may know him from his Emmy Award winning show, No Reservations, where he does pretty much everybody's dream job, including mine, of traveling the world and eating whatever the hell he wants, including some things that there's no way you could pay me enough, I think, to actually eat, but there you go. Uh, he has a second show debuting on the Travel Channel in November called The Layover, which is described as a high octane travel series that follows him to cities around the world as he gives viewers the inside scoop on where to eat, where to drink, and what to do on a 24 hour layover. He has written several books, including Kitchen Confidential, A Cook's Tour, and Medium Raw, which I see a lot of you guys have in the audience. Um, these are books that made many people, including myself, decide never to eat fish again on a Monday. And in case you don't know why, it's because apparently that's where all the crap from the week before goes to the Monday specials, so don't eat it. Um, he's joined today by his Emmy Award winning team from No Reservations on the Layover. We have, starting right here, Tom Vitale, an Emmy nominee, producer director of No Reservations and the Layover. Uh, Zach Zamboni, to his right, is a two-time Emmy winning director of photography of No Reservations and also the director of photography for the Layover. And obviously, Chef Anthony Bourdain is right next to him who we've already given the, uh, <laughs> in case you don't know who that is. And then uh, Todd Liebler to his right, who's a two-time Emmy winning director of photography of No Reservations. So we've asked Chef Bourdain to run the discussion here today, so I have no idea what they're gonna talk about, but I have a feeling it's gonna involve food and travel and possibly his girlfriend, Paula Dean. I don't know, we'll see. All right, thanks. There's an idea. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess what, what we like to talk about today is making things. You know, we, we, we make things. And with the, uh, the, the people on this stage, uh, make, along with a much larger group of people, uh, equally hardworking, uh, make no reservations and uh, the new series. I guess why it's us up here rather than Lydia Tenaglia or Chris Collins or Sandy or Helen or all of the people who in post-production, uh, editing, uh, sound, color correction, or all these other you know, incredibly vital <laughs> components of, what, of the show. The reason these guys are up here is because we spent, we were just talking about, we spent around 200 days a year with each other on the road. We're the, we're the principal road team. Uh, for no reservations, we spent a lot of miles, uh, a lot of time, a lot of drinks, a lot of poop jokes. Um, <laughs> and so I thought we'd talk today about how we do what we do and really why, you know, I joke about it, but I mean it. For me, the worst thing about the show, in a perfect world, I would not be on it, okay? I would, I would not be on no reservations. I would. You would see the world the way I want it. I, I see it. I would go, I would see it, I would narrate the show, and it would be told through my point of view. But I would really like to not see my stupid face up there. Um, so even if, if you imagine the show without me in it, I think it would still be the best goddamn travel and food show on television, like ever. And so the question of the day is, how come it's just so fucking good? <laughs> Tom Vitale, producer, director. <laughs> Perhaps you could explain like the process. How does it all begin? Like you know, a, a, a typical show if such a thing exists. Hey, Tony's picking on me because he knows I'm terrified of public speaking. But um, <laughs> how does it all begin? Well, we start about a month before we go out. I generally, I pick. I'll pick a spot. Yeah. Tony picks happens. a spot, you have an idea, sometimes a film that reminds you of the place. You give us some direction and we go out and find interesting locations, interesting people, interesting things to do, and the rest sort of takes care of itself on its, in a strange way. Really? So anybody could do it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can follow Tom Vitale <laughs> at TV Superstar, that's his Twitter feed, by the way. Uh, so, uh, at Zach Zamboni, uh, yes, surely it's not that simple. Come on, the show looks amazing. Look it's, at all the a, other shows like to try to be like us. They suck. Yeah. The meal scenes are all sitting there like, like, like mummies. You know, Welcome to my home. 
guy. Uh, you know, please enjoy our food. Uh, you know, the, 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 the photography's ugly, the, the lighting, if, if any, seems spectacularly inept. Uh, there's no human dimension. Uh, it's all happy horse shit, everything's gray. Please help me understand, why are we so damn good, Zach Zamboni? We got heart, man, you know? We got heart, I think that's you, me, these guys, post people, editors, I mean, everybody involved's got heart, and we're trying to do something good, you know? And we've got skills, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I, I do think it, it, we got heart, we're trying to do something Okay, but heart, heart explains why, I, I, I think, why particularly, you know, a meal scenes with people seem to work mm -hmm. a little bit better. You know, I, I've often said, you know, we, <laughs> that we, we take the time, we, you know, we drink with people, you know, the you know that, that we're not alcoholics, that we're, we're television professionals, <clears throat> um, drinking with our subjects and, uh, the people who host us on the show uh, it, it certainly helps, but I think it's a it's it's a function of we spend the time with the people. We're not just gang rushing some poor rice farmer, mm -hmm. you know, and and saying okay, you know, the scene's starting now. You know, here, you know, get Tony out of the trailer. I go in, mm -hmm. I sit down, I take a couple of bites. You know, mm, good, back to the trailer. The the four minute scene um, represents about how long? What do you think? Uh, typically, okay, yeah. yeah. Laos show, for instance, you know, maybe it's a four, five, six minute meal scene. How long did it take you guys to get those shots and how much do you shoot between your two or three cameras, because you operate a camera as well, mm -hmm. uh, for a show like that? Well, you know, we probably are there two, two to three hours before you're even there because we're shooting the prep of the food, which is actually a great way to get involved with the family. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as a lot of you probably know, a lot of stuff happens in the kitchen. You know, that's where the, the hearth is. So we go in there and have a relationship often incredibly nonverbal, right? Because, I mean, my, as people on the crew know, my uh, grasp of foreign languages is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, we, you know, we go into the kitchen and uh, we are just taking an interest in what, we're, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that immediately, I think, just opens them up to us. And, of course, we're open to them because we're trying to just uh, get in there. I mean, you're in the kitchen, often in a very tight space with, you know, somebody's grandma. She's not used to having other people in the kitchen other than family to start with. And she's certainly not used to this, you know, especially you're talking the mountains of Laos, Mm -hmm. This invading army of hulking, you know, white people from America mm -hmm. with cameras, you know, that is a weird and terrifying thing to to, to people, you know, particularly in the, you know, a, you know, hill tribe region of, of Laos. I keep using that as a, as an example because that was probably I'm trying to think of where we appeared as the most sort of shocking apparitions, mm -hmm. you know, so. You know, when you go into a room with cameras, mm -hmm. it, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets weird. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of the struggle, I think one of the things that we, that you guys in particular do <clears throat> really, really well, it makes all the difference, is the time spent to A, um, g let people get over that shock. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you're in, you know, it's often you, you're in the kitchen with grandma. You know, you're, she's bumping you out of the way, you're smiling at each other, you're expressing a willingness to, to try things, you're, you're open to the experience, you're uh, uh, clearly appreciative of, of what's going on and interested. You know, people are proud of their food, mm -hmm. wherever they are, just about everywhere in the world. People are proud of their food, it means something, it reflects um, their, their history, their family history, their ethnic history, uh, often a, 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 a long story of struggle and deprivation to, to, to arrive at these dishes. It means a lot. Uh, they tend to like it wherever you go when, 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 when your guest is willing to smile and, 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 and try it and, and be open to it. Um, but I think that time you put in with, you know, petting the family dog, playing with the kids. Uh, Milking you know, the yaks. Right? <laughs> uh, drinking the local rot gut because, mm -hmm. let's face it, in a lot of these situations, in almost all of them, Somebody somewhere is fermenting or distilling something cloudy in the backyard somewhere on a 55-gallon drum. And a willingness to drink that makes a big 
big difference in how things are going to go. Um, so there's that. You know, I talk about time, but then again, this is a you know, this is a handcrafted outfit. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is uh, you know, we're not Target. You know, we're mm -hmm. We're Hermes, okay? We're, we're, yeah. It takes a long damn time to make the, the bag. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, okay, it's expensive, but it's a damn nice bag. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, it's like the Japanese craftsman that believes that they're part of what they make. I think we go in like that. We know our signature is on this thing we're making. We're not, not you know, we're making this thing that represents us, and we put... We stand by it, you know? We, you ever watch a show, you ever watch make a show, and later, you know, I mean, to me it's really, really important. Whatever I did yesterday, I would really, you know, I know the feeling of waking up, looking in the mirror, and going, oh, God, oh. You know, I, whatever I did yesterday was really, really shameful and embarrassing, you know? That's the story of a lot of my life. Um, I guess I'm determined whatever I do on television to, to not be, you know, Really, I would love to make a joke about the chew right now. <laughs> Should I? No. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, I can't, I'm constitutionally unable to wake up in the morning, to know that I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and think, Jesus, God, that show we did was really cynical and cheap and stupid. I don't care if people liked it. It, it, it sucked. Have you ever woken up in the morning and, you know, and seen, you know, after seeing a show that you made and thought, oh, man. I think that's one of the amazing things about working on this show is that, I mean, we all feel so proud, like Zach said, of, you know, the, the product that we put out there. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very special. There's so many other people who work on shows that, I mean, you just, like you say, you don't get to go home and feel really proud about what you do. So it's kind but, of awesome. Oh, you knew this was coming too. <laughs> what about the Romania show, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> now, here's, the, like, here's the, the problem for me on the show is that, on one hand, it's a good thing. Like, if the show goes really, really badly, we 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 tell that story anyway, you know. Um, and if it goes really badly and it's an utter misery for me, as I found out painfully through Tom's one of Tom's early masterpieces, apparently that's pretty damn entertaining. Oh. Do you care to tell? I mean, how how badly did that shoot go? It went pretty badly. I think I can't imagine any other episode that's gone. It, everything it was it was a perfect storm. Everything was so bad that it ended up being so great in the end. But ultimately, I think it was a fair and accurate representation of our you know eight ten days there. Ultimately, so I can go to bed at night and you know sleep with an easy conscience because again, that's a, a fair representation of what we saw during our time there. It might not be all of Romania. And we certainly didn't go out to, you know, assassinate a country. No, we tried to do right. We did. We, we did. We tried to. We had the intention of doing right by that people. At the end of the day, that was some funny shit, though. Yeah, we tried. <laughs> we tried. Show sure look good. I just want to say anecdotally, he's this guy. It's like when it starts raining, right? We're in the middle of some, we're in the middle of nowhere. We got no cover, no trees, no nothing. It starts raining. And, and I'm like, and I'm always. Okay, this scene's yeah. over. We're, we're screwed. This is going to work out. Time to move to plan B. We're like, shit. And he goes, yes. <laughs> Every time, he's like, yes. <laughs> Bad weather makes for good TV. Yeah, and he's just like, as soon as things start to go off the track, he just, is, he naturally is like, He starts this to is, smell this is perfect. Emmy. Yeah. No, but I mean, that, that's one of the, the things that I've learned so much about this show. I mean, there is no script. We don't go in with a script. We don't do multiple takes of things, you know. If Tony says something or one of the people we're filming says something and we don't catch it for whatever reason because we're shooting a food insert, we don't ask them to say it again. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, lends that feeling of immediacy and, you know, to, to the show. It doesn't feel scripted or forced. Well, what do, we, and, what do I hate most? What do we hate most on the show? The walk-in yeah. and, and the goodbye. Back, way back when, we would do what was called the walk-in, where it's like, okay, Tony, stand outside the house and this is the scene where you walk in and you meet your hosts. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and worst case scenario would be, okay, well, we kinda, we'd like to do that again. Boy, you, you, I, it's impossible to feel any more of an asshole than, you know, <laughs> warmly introduce yourself to somebody and then say, I'll be right back to do it again. Or, 
Only thing worse is to thank you so much for the meal and letting me in your home. Mm. Goodbye. <laughs> and then you got to go back and do that again. So we, we just don't, we don't do it. I mean, or, the whole organism is created to never have that kind of artificiality. Mm -hmm. uh, so favorite shows, well, favorite show for you uh, to watch and then favorite show of yours to, to make. Is there a difference? Well, yeah. uh, sure there is. Uh, I, Haiti uh, was just unbelievable because I think as uh, I believe Lydia was saying or someone, we were just running on all cylinders there. Mm. Yeah, you won an Emmy for that one, didn't you? Uh, I, I <laughs> might that so. weigh heavily on your. <laughs> well, hey, I, I, you know, I was asked, "Is there something you'd want to push forward?" And I said, "Yes, eighty. Mm -hmm. So that was, I think, amazing. I mean, every step of the way, I would watch it and just be mm -hmm. pretty overwhelmed and very proud. Mm -hmm. So, fa the favorite favorite show? You think proudest of that one? Right now, yeah. uh, <laughs> most fun show to do. Well, the, uh, the, the uh, India show we did a making of, so we had yeah. two crews on, a lot of friends. It was a lot of fun. That was nice. You know, you know all my stuff hit the editing room floor, but you know, what am I going to do? It's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> Your uh, favorite uh, show you're proudest of, uh, and then uh, the show that was the most fun to shoot? It's so hard to say. People ask that a lot, actually. Because there's moments, you know, we have these moments in our lives. There's moments we have together making the show that are just, just incredible moments. Like the, that little rail, the railroad in thing Cambodia. in Cambodia, Cambodia the riding the, the scooters stone, in Laos. Stone on top of this sort of moving uh, platform built out of wood that they, they jury rigged together and put on rails uh, with a little putt-putt engine, like a lawnmower engine moving, and... moving farmers through the rice paddies. And we were all uh, post-dinner, I think we might have sort of beamed up a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's his yeah moments, that was nice. Know? <laughs> yeah. The sun was setting and blowing through these ah, rice fields. Yeah. It's, it's all you know together after a rainstorm with this beautiful fresh mm -hmm. air and you know so what, you're getting paid right now. You, your favorite show to do to shoot that that you're proudest of and then the most. I think I would shoot. have to agree with Todd about Haiti being one of the ones that I'm the most proud of. It was um, it was a very difficult shoot. It was, uh, you know, there was a lot of heartbreak mm -hmm. spending time with these people and then we get on the airplane and disappear and come back here and they're left, they're left there. So that was, that was pretty rough. But it was also an amazingly magical place. Mm -hmm. There was just, it was enchanting. There was something really enchanting about it and it was just so intense. What about the most fun show? We gotta say Rome here. Come on. I think Rome, Rome was a really fun show. show. Rome is the show that I'm that's, most that's, proud of. That's an amazing because show. Because we did, it all started out with, I think, this group. We're all sitting around in a hotel lobby somewhere talking about films we like and, and, and how we could do, you know, I think the, the, the driving mission of this show is that whatever worked last week, whatever we did last week, no matter how well it was received, how successful it was, how the ratings were, how much people loved it, whatever we're going to do next week, we want to try really, really hard to undermine completely what we did last week. Mm -hmm. We want to present a moving target. We don't want ever for the network to be able to say, mm -hmm. I think I figured out what the hell it, it is that you guys are doing. Let's do more of that. Because mm -hmm. by the time they figure that out, we will have moved on mm -hmm. to something else. So we spent a lot of time sitting around, having a few cocktails, thinking, what is the most fucked up thing we can do? Mm -hmm. And I don't know which one of you guys said, let's do a food show mm -hmm. all in black and white. Yeah. That's yeah. how good we are. We can make food porn in black and white. And when we started talking about, <laughs> then we started talking about early uh, neo-realist Italian films that you know one percent of our audience might have seen, and we went out and did just about the stupidest thing you could do on, on you know on, in a, on travel and food. We made it all black and white show, yeah. lit. We never light. Nah. But we lit. We lit. Yeah, they said no way. They said that was. Impossible. It is our. It is they for me. It it's no, my my it proudest. Be my proudest moment because it was just so stupid. And, and it looks yeah. so beautiful. And the work you guys did and the, 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 the editing and mm -hmm. the, the, the music, everything, everybody, everything worked exactly better than we could have imagined. It all came together. When, that said, the first yeah. Tuscany show that everybody hates, that was, yeah. that, that was a fun show to make. It was a fun show to make. Yeah. Okay, what about worst? Just lowest moment. What's the worst thing about making this show? I mean, we have the best jobs in the world. Everybody says so, and, and it's true. 
What do we do for a living? We travel around eating and, and drinking to excess and making incredibly self-indulgent television any way we damn please <laughs> with, with as little creative, well, as, as little creative interference as I think most people, have, very few people are able to do what we, we Since do. Since we're talking about Italy, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Sicily show, which I think was a season two or three, we had a uh, fixer that was very self-involved. <laughs> and uh, it was... The know, helicopter, oh, she no come. Yeah. You know, oh, we're going to go swim with the turtles today. Uh, the turtle is sick. sick. <laughs> Nothing worked, right? How about the sea urchin scene? Oh, that was last week. Every, you know, everything. There, it was a, there was a desperation as the, each day goes by, and we, 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 don't know what to, we don't know what to do, you know, right? We, mm. We just had to make it up. So that was tough. Yeah. I jumped off a cliff into water at a permanent cool. depth. That was a measure of our desperation. So <laughs> spinal injury, it's always entertaining. You know, that'll get us five minutes. I don't know. Um, Bat Caves and Bill Murray, man, those are my two worst moments. Just worst. Bill Murray? Yeah, you remember that when Went in there, did all the sun path work and everything was perfect and I had all these I had these silks laid because it was all glass. Go well, to this giant restaurant, it's all glass, looks out on the Hudson. Right, oh, that's it's right. A perfect, and Bill Murray cloudy was, day. was half. First of all, we were oh, supposed to, so we're, my we're, hero I'm supposed to shoot horrible. with somebody for, for dinner. First, you've got to understand this about Bill Murray. If you want to make like Ghostbusters 3 and give him like $30 million to appear in it, apparently he has no agent, he has no attorney. You, you have to like, you call an answering machine somewhere and leave a message, and maybe, maybe you'll hear back five years later. <laughs> so this, he just doesn't behave the you don't reach out to his people right uh, and I was supposed to have a, a someone else shooting with me a meal scene in the Hudson Valley and and they fell through and the chef of the place said well how about Bill Murray you want Bill Murray on the show and I'm like come on you fucking okay. he showed up like the next day to yeah. the scene I think he hitchhiked to the scene <laughs> just walks in the whole time I'm 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 sitting there like I have no idea what I'm saying I know my lips are moving I'm just sitting there talking to him and the cameras are rolling and I'm thinking, the whole time, I can't believe Bill Murray's on my show. <laughs> this is so cool. Why is Bill Murray on my show? <laughs> and then just as Bill launched into a rare moment of personal reflection. I don't know, the most meaningful, I think it was the most meaningful, uh, tearful so moment of his life. What happened? <sighs> Sun went behind the cloud. There's nobody that makes No, the sun uh, went into his Nobody eyes. would make me <laughs> nervous like that. I mean it was just because it was it was Bill Murray. But I'd done all the sun path work to know exactly where the sun was going to be, and I'd hung some silks, silks up on the window so that if it came out, I'd be able to drop it right in time so it wouldn't be direct sun right on right. Bill's face. So, of course, as soon as he started talking about that, right. so that I remember. the sun came he was out, just about to say, and, wrong and place. because of that, like, totally in the wrong place. And because, so it was like this, well, Tony, I've never told anyone this before, but after that childhood tragedy, that was the moment I decided to become an, and suddenly I see Zach running through the back of the scene. <laughs> it came out, and it just, it was like this piece of sun that had worked its way around everything I'd put up, and it was right there, right in the worst place possible. What about you? Remember looking, and they were, your worst yeah, moment? <laughs> Single worst moment? You weren't the guy who, too, who, who wired up the inside of the MIG, the jet. That was We me. spent like thousands of dollars for me to go up in a, in a, in a Russian fighter plane and they, they rigged up the entire interior with tiny little cameras and it was, I think it was a new shooter. It wasn't any one of this. <laughs> and we go up, we do the whole thing, all these barrel rolls, you know, lots of comedic footage of me struggling to not blow chunks. We land, we hadn't turned the camera on. <laughs> Sweet. Not me. No. I'm responsible for other breakdowns. The so worst, lowest moment? Technical screw up? Well, I think the one you keep picking on <laughs> now, three seasons later, is just my, you know, I knocked over a dish. Or two. Or 12. <laughs> it is a classic a gross. moment. You know, Todd, you, were, you, know, you have many virtues, but, but Nijinsky-like grace is not one of them. <laughs> and there's one of them, I forget the name, Padang restaurant? Padang. Padang. Restaurants where they in, in Indonesia, right, where they stack uh, basically all of the dishes in a tr huge triangular formation in the window, um, and underneath it are the mother sauces, meaning the, bit, the the buckets of the backup. You know, basically the entire the restaurant's entire food supply for the day, and he's filming close up, and the 
<laughs> Mike hits one of the plates, the whole thing comes down, everything shatters, everything falls in. You know, all the village elders are sitting there waiting for their food. Of course, it was classic television, and we've, we've used that clip at least four times in further shows. <laughs> but what made it great for me was that years later, we're in like rural Sichuan province mm -hmm. of China. Oh, you know, it was up in the mountains. It was in uh, Yunnan or Sichuan. We're up in the mountains. I think some Singapore and a Malaysian tourist are walking by, and they just they, they see Todd, and they start pointing at him like, <laughs> Mr. Clumsy Man! <laughs> Your worst moment? The uh, Brazil shoot was really, really rough. We I mean, all got I make really you more sick. miserable than anybody, I think. For if, if anybody bears the full brunt of my unhappiness, <laughs> self-doubt, self-loathing, and misery, it's, it's you. So you pretty much have, you have a pretty wide menu to select from here. <laughs> Brazil? Brazil, well, you had hurt your back. Zach had the 104 degree fever. We were stranded on an island, you know. Yeah, that was rough. I like that the part where we're, we're waiting on, we're waiting for the plane, and you know, we're like four hours by boat from anywhere. We're waiting on this little island in the in the Amazon, and you know, it's late, and, and these a couple of other like you know Europeans or Americans show up on the tarmac who we haven't seen out in the jungle at all, and we turned to our guide and said, "Who are they?" And he said, "Oh yes, they too are waiting for their plane. They they come every day." <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. man. So let's do this. Let's take questions from from you guys, um, for any and all, please. Any uh, any. How you yeah. doing? Hi. Um, so I have two questions. One's for Anthony, and one's for everybody else. Uh, the first question is with, you know, all the shooting and the traveling and the book writing and whatever. Do you even get a chance to cook anymore? And if not, do you miss it? Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is on location. Which one of you has the most fortitude? Um, uh, okay, uh, I don't get to cook much. Very, 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 very rarely do I get to cook either at home or on the road. I'm actually really, some of my happier moments on this show are when I get to cook uh, either on camera or better yet off camera. Uh, one of the reasons I like Tuscany because, you know, we all rented a villa. You know, it was very, talk about self indulgent the idea was to make a show about us making a show. About, you know, it was a show about us going and staying in a fabulous villa on a hilltop in Tuscany and then making a show about the process of living in a fabulous villa. And, <laughs> but I, one of the fun part for me is I, I got to, I get to cook, you know, off camera. You know, we do these little potluck things. I got to cook pasta. That always uh, makes me uh, happy. And the, uh, I'm sorry, the second question was? The Which one of you has the most fortitude on location? It's, Tom. TV, it's at TV Superstars, yeah. his Twitter handle, by the way. <laughs> far, far and away, this guy's up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. You know, he's a slave driver. He pushes his crew yeah. really, really hard, but he's also up earliest out there. If it's really, really stupid and suicidal and incredibly hot and we don't really need the footage, he's going to go out and do it anyway yeah. himself if necessary. And he's going to go all night long. And in between that, He'll be fretting and worrying and going out and scouting locations. Mm -hmm. And he just goes and goes and goes. And Absolutely. Mobs in Thailand shooting under trains in India and mm -hmm. being attacked by Gila monsters. Yeah. And, you know. He's always smiles every morning. It's a little I look scary. forward to that. Every morning, Tom, big smile. Good morning, guys. Hey, guys. Another day, another day at the office. Another day at the office. I love this job. And we're like, <laughs> you know, we're crippled from the day. Yeah, so without, a, without doubt, it's, yeah, it's, it's, Tom. It, it's Tom. Are we here? Thanks, guys, for uh, being here. Um, sorry, I'm recording this. My wife, Lisa, is back home in uh, Mountain View. I'm from the Mountain View office, and uh, she's a former Googler, huge fan, and so I'm kind of channeling her right now and, and here, <laughs> hey. enjoying your presence. Hi. <laughs> I'm sure she would say hi if she was here. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, it seems like you guys are doing exactly what you want to be doing and what you want to love, uh, what you love. And um, she's somebody who's still trying to find that. She's actually a really talented Italian American cook and chef, and somebody who I think should just go to culinary school and do it. But she's, you know, I think she's maybe afraid or, or not sure about what dream to pursue. Um, and so, any advice for somebody looking to, to find what they love? Short answer on on the cooking is: if before you spend money on cooking school go and work in a restaurant even for free if necessary. Work in a busy restaurant and, and, and you know, give yourself enough time to understand how hard it is, 
how little money you will be making, how long it will take you to pay back that student loan, uh, how, how just how difficult and unglamorous it is, um, and, and, and how insane you have to be to, 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 to find a home. In the, you know, there are two types of people, who, people who love the restaurant business and, and thrive on that sort of insanity and, and adrenaline and futility and, and, and inequity and, 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 sounds great. and the pressure sounds, in the heat. And then there really are good. normal people, and you need to find out before you go to school. So I'm all for pursuing your dream. But, but I think it's a good idea to go find out early, you know, before you invest in that dream, either time or money, you know, find out what that means. Uh, you know, if there's a downside, uh, you know, I don't know how we all got this gig. You know, I, I think it was, yeah, I mean, I, you know, are you pursuing your dream? <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's selfish, though. I mean, no, let's face it. You know, uh, uh, you know, being married to any of us uh, would be would be difficult. We're away a lot, and I think it's also. I mean, what do you talk about to your friends when you, you know, when you come back? You know, when you when you have a life like us, who do you talk to? You know, your friends from high school or who I used to my friends from high school or I used to work with in the kitchen only eleven years ago, twelve years ago. So what did you do last week? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I saw a Yankee game and, you know, went out for a beer. You know, normal stuff that actually sounds pretty good to me. You know, what did you do? Oh, I was, uh, me and Zach and Todd and Tom were all sitting on top of a dune in the empty quarter of Arabian Peninsula smoking some hash, looking out, <laughs> looking out over the vast expanse of desert. Then we got together with these Bedouin dudes and playing drums and hanging out for hours. <laughs> then we were in, like, a war and... And, you know, how do you, you know, you're not doing anybody a favor by telling them that, you know what I mean? So it is kind of, you know, we do live in a kind of freakish bubble when you come back, or at least I do. You know, what do you say? Yeah, well, I always... It's a little wanted, alienating. It's alienating. Yeah, they always want to know what you're up to. I always want to talk to them about the normal stuff, though. Like, yeah, let's talk about fishing, or, yeah. you know, let's, give me something normal to talk about. Always so you'd ever want to like rub it in, you know? I ate oh, a bully no, last I, week. You know, I want to talk. No. Talk normal stuff. No. But you got to keep it. You keep that secret. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like if you had this amazing, amazing thing happen, and let's face it, amazing, amazing things happen to us all the time. Is it? Is it? Do you tell people? You know, the, I'm always asked, "Where's your favorite place?" Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, hands down, I say Brooklyn. You know, you know. I mean, that should so totally run for office, dude. <laughs> <laughs> City <Panorama>. Council, L I E B L E R. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yes. Okay, so my question for you is: Would you eat Andrew Zimmern? No, that's not my real question. <laughs> but I, Listen, but Andrew's a good friend. I'll let you go. Know, <laughs> Andrew's a good friend, but I'll, I'll put it this way: If we're on a lifeboat long enough. And he's not keeping up with the rowing? <laughs> Slow braise. So, uh, my, my real question is, you get your, well, dangerous situations, sticky situations, the bat cave was scary, you know, um, riot, someone brings out like a vat of alcohol with dead birds in it, what are you gonna do? So, like, when do you say no? When do you say, uh-uh, I'm not doing this? He when does it ever happen? No. <laughs> like, do you ever just Let's feel ask like Tom. you're in danger, or? When, do we, when have we said, Okay, we're not doing that. I, I can't. I can't think of a time. It's it's strange, you know, when you're shooting the, you're there with a the camera, and we're making the show. You cease to become yourself. You're not yourself anymore. You're not a regular human being. You just have to mm -hmm. just do it. I mean, because any time you close yourself off to any opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, when when you have, you're so lucky enough to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be a fool to say no to anything. We've been. I'm looking back there, I've done some really, really stupid things on the show mm -hmm. that I probably wouldn't do again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm a dad now, you know, and I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't make the jump off that cliff for sure. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you we're either going to, we're either, you're in a situation, you know, violating your deeply held principles about what to eat, for instance. You know, is it a pet or is it food? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I do have deeply held principles there, you know? Is it re repulsive to me, or is it even rotten? 
I'm going to eat it, okay? Uh, rather than offend my host, I'm mm -hmm. going to try it. Um, sometimes that ends badly. When, when have you said, have we said not? Here, you're another knucklehead. He's hanging out of helicopters, mm -hmm. you know, going out, or doing stuff that, like, just seeing him like, in, in Iraq when we're, I'm, I'm out of the, the rear hatch of a, of a Russian helicopter of dubious airworthiness, mm -hmm. you know, with the hatch in the back opens up. And I'm strapped, I mean, I have a tether cord and I'm there on the thing and there's, you know, wind coming. These guys are hanging out way further. Just looking at him with the camera, my, my you know, my palms were sweating. Uh, so I know you don't say no. I haven't seen you. You really have to, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right double negative, but like suspend <laughs> disbelief. Because you're doing things and you're thinking, well, you know, that, uh, that rail car in, in Cambodia that goes off the rails and we're going at, you know, 50 miles an hour, mm -hmm. it's not going to be a pretty sight. Mm -hmm. But you just have to pull back from that mm -hmm. and just be there in the moment and not think of the consequences looking of through, that moment. Looking through the camera really yeah, helps. True. It, it yeah. takes you, you know. So what's my excuse? <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back to alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife frequently tells me that if I were to be reincarnated, I would want to come back as you, Tony. So uh, it's probably true. And I, I wanted to ask, since you said it yourself, you've got a pretty good gig, good life. You guys feel pretty blessed. Who would you like to come back as? Seriously, I would like to come back as Bootsy Collins. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody who plays bass guitar as well as Bootsy Collins. Like I, Flea, I figured it'd be rock and roll related. Flea or uh, Larry Graham. You know, I would, I would play bass for like J the early James Brown and the Famous Flames or or Parliament Funkadelic. I would play funk bass <laughs> incredibly well. I would throw it all away for that, honestly. If I could just play bass, you know, at all. But, but yeah. or, or, no, really, really, really well. Uh, that to me seems like something I would cheerfully, could, yeah, I wouldn't mind coming back. I don't think I'm gonna get that lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks Hi. so much for being here today. So I have two questions. One is about Iceland, and the other mm -hmm. one's about Peru. So the first one is, so Iceland's somewhere I've always wanted to go, but I have to say after watching your show, I'm not so sure, because mm -hmm. um, it just sounded like everything tasted so terrible. So one, my first question is, is there anything there that any of you ate that was good? No, there's, there's good food there, and there's good, there are good restaurants. What you is can it? eat very, very well there. They have you know, European and new Scandinavian cuisine. It's very exciting, you know, on the fine dining end and their everyday food is pretty decent. Their traditional holiday food is probably the worst in the world. But you're not gonna to have to eat that unless you want to. Um, my problem with Iceland is it's tiny. I mean, as far as, you know, it's, you know, there's one big city, it's not that big, eight bars. Basically, you're gonna be doing a lot of drinking, unless you were into hiking and outdoorsy shit, which I am totally not into. <laughs> You know, hiking, you drive around in five you know, days. cross country yeah. skiing, you know, hiking, uh, you know, mountain biking, it sounds like hell to me. <laughs> uh, rock climbing, then it, it's, it's, it's a wonderland. It's an incredible, incredibly beautiful country filled with spectacular natural vistas. Big deal. Did you ride the um, horses? Did you ride the horses there? There, yeah, they, I rode the, the little, the, the little, little horses. Yeah, <laughs> they're, the they're cute. Really smooth, cute, cute horses. A lot of drinking, a lot of marinating in hot tubs, in, in, uh, in, in the hot springs, more drinking. And then you guys made a really nature. funny commercial at the end. Like, yeah. Yeah, that was hilarious. Not my favorite place. Peru, completely <clears throat> awesome. So I was in the Amazon earlier this year. So I want to know about that fermented, the, the woman you showed her. I have to say, when you showed her spitting into the cup and mm -hmm. making, I was grossed out. Very, 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 very traditional well, all through the Andes Mountains. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be hanging out in rural, uh, you know, mountain regions of uh, south of, of Latin America, you will be drinking that stuff and what liking it, it. What did it taste like? Sort of a, like a... Saliva. <laughs> <laughs> um, like pulque, if you've ever had pulque in Mexico, it's sort of a sour milk, if you can pick... Beer with a sour milk component. Not that Good. bad. Not, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi again. Um, I have a bunch of close friends that aren't here that were like, you have to ask, but Rome, because our favorite, the cacio e pepe dish that you ate, where was that at? The restaurant's name was Roma Sparita. I believe so. Yeah. Roma in Sparita. the 
Trastevere district? Trastevere. Roma so. Sparita. I'm going. Yeah, Thanks. go. <laughs> yeah, by all means. Over here. Uh, I'm unfortunately a little less traveled than some of my coworkers. I'm just going to straight for your heart. Anthony, any bar recommendations in the neighborhood? <laughs> here? In, in, in New York? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I don't get out to bars much anymore. Uh, one of the, you know, the, you know, the, my favorite dive bar uh, closed down. I, I like the uh, distinguished Wakamba Lounge on uh, uh, its 9th Avenue, oh, I'm sorry, 8th Avenue and it's right around 30th. 30th. It was right next to where Papaya King used to be. About, 30th, 38th, 38th. That is a sinister, awesome, you know, late afternoon, late night uh, drink and bar. You know, it has sort of a vaguely Latino tiki kind of a thing going on. <laughs> it's really one of the last true dives uh, in the area in, a, in, a, in, a, in an increasingly yuppified world. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Thanks again for coming here to talk to us as well. Like, um, I think a few years ago, you once said your f perfect meal was going to be a bowl of pho in Saigon. Mm. Uh, it's a very similar question to what you were saying. So when you're in New York, where would you go for such a meal? You know, uh, that's a thing. When you've had really good, you know, good pho in Hanoi or Saigon, it really kind of ruins it for you here. <laughs> it's like there are places that have decent pho, but I need pho in context now. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not happy eating it in, in New York. I want to be on a low plastic stool. <laughs> I, I want, I need the roll of toilet paper on the table, <laughs> the, the little toothpick dispenser, the sort of grimy bottle of fish sauce. The, oh, I need the condiments there. You know, I need the, the chopsticks, the, 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 the dirty spoons, the, the tissues on the ground. And I need, you know, Vietnam outside. I need to smell those smells and see Vietnam, and it's part of the experience for me. Uh, so I, I just, I, I'm not having as much fun. I, I don't, I, I never go out for fun in New York. I really am, it's why I'm, maybe I'm so happy when I get it uh, over there, and I am ridiculously happy getting it there. What, what, what interesting question, since you know, we're all world travelers here, your, your go-to international dish, I mean, uh, you know, of all the things you've eaten, the one that you'd probably be happiest to, to do again. My favorite is still, you know, Nona Josepina's ragu in Naples. You know, with grandma cooking, you know, meat and tomato sauce for 10 hours, you know, with her right there, chain smoking the whole time. <laughs> what that's, are that's my I favorite. can't answer it. There's too many little... Oh, pick one, come on. I can't. I mean, in China, we've had some incredible meals. In Spain, with Hamon, we've had... In Italy, we've had some incredible, just incredible meals. It's too hard to say. No help. I can't. <laughs> You know, my short-term memory is only working now, so that, that uh, two bowls of risotto we just had oh, in, in Croatia, in Croatia yeah. was pretty incredible. Yeah, 12 hours they're making this ragu of, of, yeah. of oxtail or something. Oh, and then they just stir in the right. Oh, man, that was good. Yeah. I'll be here. I'll be here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, uh, yeah. Being here, um, I just have two very easy questions, but if I don't ask, I'll probably regret it for at least a decade. Um, so, in the spirit of that man's wife, whose energy I'm also sort of channeling, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where he is. So to speak, yes. <laughs> um, have you ever considered having an apprentice, even just for one episode, a special contest where someone gets to join you? We've done it. Yeah, but yeah, continue. So the next question is, can you do it again and can that be me? <laughs> where, would you, uh, where would you choose to go if you, were, uh, you had to pick a spot to take us? Uh, that's a good question. So you've been to a lot more places than I have. I'd like to actually try South Africa. There's other places in Africa that I'd like to try going. I'm actually I'm fairly well traveled for my age. I love to eat too, but there's... Uh, I, I like places that are really off the beaten path, as I'm sure you do. There's a real untapped. risk to this, by the way. You know, we, we did solicit a, a contest winner to take us to their choice of places. I the saw world. that a few years ago, yeah. And man, these people got so much shit from our home mm -hmm. team. The poor guy from the Philippines who, who is his life's dream. You know, he's a, you know, I think he'd emigrated as a child. He knew nothing, of, very little of his country. I think he'd been once. He was desperate to, 
yearning to reconnect with his, his family from whom he'd been separated, his culture, and he single-handedly convinced me to, to, to take the show to the Philippines. Man, he got dumped on so bad by his countrymen. They were like, you're not Filipino enough. I could have done better. My grandmother's food is better. You, you know, he got a lot of crap for that. Uh, the Buffalo dude got a lot. We, we, we did it basically four, four times. Yeah. People, t like I said, the, the flip side of people taking their food very personally and being very proud of it is they get really pissed off when they, they think that somebody else from their team hasn't represented well. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, is a, there is a dark side to that, uh, that job. <laughs> You had a second question to that? Uh, or that was too far? The part? second question was, can it be me? Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I have a question about music, because mm -hmm. you talk a lot about how much you love music. I'm curious, uh, what would you see, who would you see play live if you could see any <coughs> touring band that's out today? Out today? Yeah. Out today. Or favorite album of the last year or so? The, of last year, uh, the, the Rome album, uh, Daniela Lupi, uh, Danger Mouse and Nora Jones, Jack White, uh, I, I think is an amazing, amazing album. It, it was like, a, I just saw the last episode of uh, Breaking Bad, uh, season mm -hmm. four, and it closes with a song from that album, and it was like, like this show wasn't awesome enough, my head just completely exploded. <laughs> um, so that, that would be the album for me of the past year. Uh, as far as who to see, I've never seen Pearl Jam. I'd, I'd like to see Pearl Jam before it's all over, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, who, would you, who do you want to see? Pavement. Pavement? Neil Young. I've never seen Neil Young live. I've seen him. Yeah, yeah, I know you have. Care? Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um. I uh, first wanted to just uh, thank you guys for what you do. Um, my wife and I had our first kid this year, and so we're on travel hiatus, and it's kind of the methadone for our travel addiction to be able to watch <laughs> your show, so thank you very much. Um, I was just curious, um, between going to a place that most people have never been or going to a place that maybe a lot of travelers have been to and trying to show something new or different or a new angle on it, which do you prefer or find more exciting to do? Uh, one demands the other, uh, especially as we do this year after year. It's like. I mean, quite frankly, if we do like a Rome show, an Italy show, and a, like a Provence show in short order, I'm putting on what, eight, 10 pounds. Okay, that's eight to 10 pounds we're putting on. There's no way that, it, it'll kill you. The, the sheer abundance of wonderfulness, uh, it, 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 it's physically just kicks the shit out of you, all that good food. Um, also, it, you start to get it's, 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 it becomes boring for the viewer, I think, if it's just one fantastic experience after another. So I think we very deliberately pick, uh, especially after a show where there's lots of good stuff and a lot of beautiful scenery, and it's a comfortable show, we're deliberately looking for some place that's both food is a struggle, and, and as importantly, whatever we're gonna be talking about is gonna be a, a, a struggle. Like, we're not sure how we're gonna feel about this. We're not going to be, you know, there are no clear-cut moral issues, you know, Haiti, Liberia, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not misery tourism where we're going in and looking to do a happy show everywhere we go, uh, but we're looking for places where we're going to be, I think, pressed or challenged. I think we did, we're, we're, we're doing that very deliberately over the last couple of seasons, I think, because otherwise the show will become boring, we will become boring, and you, you know, frankly, you, you enjoy your fantastic bowl of fettuccine carbonara a hell of a lot more when you've just been to a country where people are really, uh, really struggling and fighting for very, very little, uh, you know, to eat. So. Well, that also answers my uh, wife's question of how you managed to stay thin. So, twofer, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Question over here. Hi. Um, in your book, Kitchen Confidential, you always talk about how it's tough to be a woman in the kitchen, and mm -hmm. you really respect women, you kind of keep up, and um, obviously you guys are a bunch of dudes, not a lot of women going on up there. Do you find that it's, <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, think that that's changing with, I mean, there's a lot of popular female well, chefs now, is that changing more and more? I think it would sound, any answer I give you would be patronizing. I think I should probably refer you to the head of our company, Lydia Tenalia, <laughs> or our executive producer, Sandy Zweig, or uh, any of the women who work who made this show, who run the show, who uh, oversee the show, uh, 
we are all products, both literatively, literally and, and uh, figuratively, of, of, you know, this is a women-run operation. Um, this, this, <laughs> yeah, all right. so, uh, the, the, the whole genesis of this show, in fact, started out uh, when uh, I met uh, Lydia Tanalia and her new husband, Chris Collins, who'd just gotten married like 10 seconds earlier, and we went out to make a Cook's tour together uh, for Food Network. So I met them. They were the people walking backwards in front of me with cameras all across Southeast Asia, and this whole team and the whole company 0.0, .0 um, and this whole enterprise came out of that very tiny uh, personal relationship. Uh, so, and over the years, uh, you know, it, it, as, it, as, it, as it has happened the last few years, we're, we're together the most, but we work with a lot of women as basically doing your, your job as shooters, uh, uh, assistant uh, directors, it's, uh, yeah, just an, an, an ugly accident that we're all dudes up here now. So before there was like a million and one celebrity chefs, who was your favorite like 80s chef, you know, in the old 80s shows and PBS? Uh, well, I revere Julia Child. I think Julia Child, I think the single most important person in American gastronomy was Julia Child, without question. Ch changed the world, uh, not professionally trained, made the world a better place, you know. I grew up of a generation where every refrigerator had a copy of her book on top. Everybody had seen the shows. Everybody was a better person, a be a, not only a better cook, but a better person and a better eater, which means better person in my view, uh, <laughs> post Julia. But I mean, Jacques Pepin, you know, if Jacques Pepin tells you this is how you make an omelet, the, the matter is settled as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's <Daughter> done. <laughs> would, would disagree, and she corrected him many times when they did a show together. It was great. Yeah, you know, Jacques write about everything. You know, there's just, there's no. That's one of the, the great joys of the show is we get to, you know, we've had Jacques Pepin on the show and, you know, that's worship, you know, worship his, his work. You know, if I, I would have loved to have Julia Child on the show, I looked up to her a lot. Yeah, he's my favorite too. Black and white food show, by the way, first couple of <laughs> First, yeah, exactly. Just saying. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I actually have a question for the production team. Um, when you're out shooting, do you always get to eat what Anthony gets to eat? What about Good places question. like El Bulli? <laughs> uh, we actually ate out by the dumpsters. <laughs> you know, the, uh, one of the... the <laughs> 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 One of the nice things about working in a kitchen is often you'll find some very nice, you know, chefs that will pop something in your mouth. So that's always a big perk of the job. But uh, we tend to eat what Tony eats, yeah. sometimes a little cold after we're done. Yeah. If it's but, bad, they're definitely eating it. It's like, <laughs> you want me to eat that? Okay, dude, here. You, what do you guys try some? Man? Yeah, it's very rare that we wouldn't eat. The same stuff. Extremely I mean, people rare. treat us very well. Yeah, it's, I mean, you've, you've all sat down at Robuchon to eat yeah. after, you know, and been, you know, sometimes the chefs, if they have time and they have the facilities, they will make a point of, okay, right. you, what about you guys? You're sitting down and you're getting the full treatment. Mm -hmm. First time we shot at Obui with uh, Lydia and, uh, and Chris, okay, they didn't get to sit down and eat all 40 courses, but they did get to stand up in the kitchen and get about 12 of them in mm -hmm. short order, which mm -hmm. was, I think, pretty cool. Um, yeah, at Chibari, I mean, we've eaten at some incredible places. Yeah, but on the other hand, this is a weird, you've touched on something that's really unusual that I noticed about television people and camera people in general. They all behave as if they're part of some weird international union. Mealtime is mealtime. They could be on their way to Robuchon knowing full well that if they just wait another hour, an hour and a half, they're going to eat the most amazing historic French meal in their life. They're still eating that, the bag of snacks and the hotel-made crummy sandwich. Every meal, it's as if it's their last. They're, they're, you load up for breakfast every day, right? You're eating that crummy breakfast at the hotel every time. And whatever nasty snack or crew meal has been packed uh, by the field producer, you're, you're, you're eating it. And I'm always, or they'll stop for lunch at some horrifying place. I'll say, 
We're just about, you know, we're about to go off to like this incredible wonderland of food. Why? Why is that, by the way? <laughs> well, food is fuel, and like you say, we have yeah. to spend a lot of time with people. You know, the scene, there's just not time for eating. I mean, you know, a few bites here or there, but it's, you don't sit down and have a full meal when we're there working. There are other things to be done, so. Yeah, you never know when your, your next meal is going to be. <laughs> you really don't. I mean, it could be eight hours, you know. It could be eight hours later. And then we'll sit down and we'll have that incredible meal at Robotron, but it'll be... Alternately, it'll be the worst thing for me is when this happened in... We did one show in China where this happened every single day. Is We're on the way to a scene, and it's... I know it's brown food. We're going to be doing brown food. It's not very visually interesting, and it's good, but it's going to be brown. And on the way, we stop off uh, the, you know, our local fixes. Say, we'll stop here. You guys need crew meal. We'll stop here. And you end up at a restaurant, and it's like, oh, my God, this food's, like, amazing. Mm -hmm. So the crew's sitting around eating this fantastic meal, and I got to sit there knowing I'm eating a, eight courses of brown food afterwards, and I was like, it's so hard to resist, you know? Actually, you were asking me what one of my favorite meals was. It was that meal. <laughs> it was. I'm not kidding. That was incredible. It was incredible. That's awesome. Um, wow. So this lifestyle, I mean, it seems totally crazy and not sustainable. Um, not that I want the show to go anywhere, but I was wondering, what is the like the long term plan for the show, and um, if any? Um, I, I'm going to keep doing it as long as it's fun and as long as I'm interested and as long as you know we 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 talk about this, you know. Um, what can we do next that's different? As long as we can figure out a way to make next episode, next season interesting to us, mm -hmm. honestly, we don't really care about the audience that much. Because <laughs> if it's not interesting to us, mm -hmm. if it's not challenging to us, if it's not fun for us, why would it be fun for anybody else? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think at this point, you know, if you guys turned to me in a lobby one day and said, you know what, I think we've gone as far with the photography as we can go. I, I just, you know, I don't know where else we're going to go here. I, I, you know, and I think if I turned to you guys and said, you know, this, this travel and eating thing, I've just, you know, I just want to go, you know, go home and you know, get a place with a yard and grow tomatoes. I think we would all sort of say, okay, that's, 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 that's when we'll stop. But until then, as long as it's fun, as long as it's interesting, and as long as we can think of something new, interesting, and hopefully frightening to the network to do next week, then, then we're going to keep doing it. No, we're not going to film you growing tomatoes? No. <laughs> the reality show, right? <laughs> no. Over here, just a couple more, yeah. Hi. Um, so a few months ago, uh, you said something kind of mean about Paula Deen, mm -hmm. and then uh, she kind of fired back at you, and there was a little bit of a back and forth, and I was just wondering if you two ever made amends, or? We don't, to be surprised, we don't hang out together, you know? <laughs> um, no, I mean, listen, I never meant to say that this is the worst person in the world or the worst person in America. I, I actually have a lot of, as a business person, I have a lot of respect for her. Um, you know, her, the story arc of her life is, you know, pretty damn impressive. I just don't like the show, and I think that the food she prepares on the show is provably bad for the country. <laughs> you know, I, you know, my show, you know, I do dangerous and, and stuff on the show. I, you know, you see me smoking on the show, drinking to excess, eating unhealthy food. The difference between my show and her show is my show comes with a parental advisory. <laughs> and I'm only suggesting that maybe hers should, should too. <laughs> uh, so thanks for, for joining us today. Um, I wanted to also first say um, I play bass, so it was great to hear you say that when it comes to back to life as a bass player. Um, so I have a few questions. First one is, if you were on Iron Chef, mm -hmm. who would you want to compete against? And don't say the new guy, because he's easier to beat. Um, and then what would your secret ingredient be? Mm, wow. T Tough one. Who, who are the Iron Chefs these days? Uh, Batali, uh, Flay, no, no, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going up against uh, Batali. Uh, the new guy is uh, Mike Simons, I think. Simon would kick my ass. And then the Flay cat, would kick my ass. Cora, right. Cat Coral would probably kick my ass too. I'm not, I was never that great a chef. Okay. <laughs> Honestly. I'm, I'm not going on, you know, right? 
You know, I, I like, I, I've often said uh, on Top Chef, um, where I'm a frequent judge, I might through age, guile, experience, hustle, street smarts, and pure bullshit be able to weasel my way four or five episodes in <laughs> before they, I got the chomp. But I, w I, would not, I would not ever be a finalist uh, or anywhere close on Top Chef. And, uh, what would my secret ingredient be? Pork. <laughs> That's a good one. And then one last question. Since no one has asked it here and you are at Google, do you guys use any of our products? What, what are your favorites? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. In fact, I believe we all use the Google family of products. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>